Good evening, everyone. I'm Tony Segreto. And once again, proud and honored to be your moderator for tonight's In the Know Town Hall. We welcome you to the second town hall in our series that we call The Science of Aging. Now, last month, many of you joined us for our talk on protecting your brain health. But tonight, we have something different for you. We're going to focus on our skin, specifically ways to protect our skin as we go and as we age, new treatments for disorders and disease of the skin, and ways to keep our skin looking healthy and beautiful. And as someone who has lived in the South Florida sun for many, many years, it is something I know I'm interested in, and I'm sure many of you are as well. As one of the largest organs in our body, the skin is our first defense against many ailments, and so it's critically important to keep it protected. And tonight, we're going to underscore this because it's so important. We have brilliant, and I stress brilliant minds from Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center and the Dr. Philip Frost Department of Dermatology and Cutaneous Surgery that will help us explore skin care and skin cures. They will share not only an overview of how the skin ages, but also methods for prevention and early detection of skin disorders. Our panelists tonight include some of the most prominent experts in dermatology and skin cancer. Dr. Robert Kirshner, Chair of the Dr. Philip Frost Department of Dermatology and Cutaneous Surgery. And Dr. Kirshner is an expert in wound healing. He will take part in the question and answer session tonight, along with Dr. Natalia Jaimes, who specializes in the early detection and prevention and treatment of melanoma. Dr. Jennifer Tang, who specializes in non-melanoma skin cancers. We will also discuss cosmetic and aesthetic dermatology to combat the aging process. Dr. Sasha Hu and Dr. Stephen Mandy are both here to share the latest on anti-aging skin rejuvenation techniques and all those techniques that we see every single day. As you can see, it is truly a world-class group of experts. Now, before we get started, let's go over how you can participate in tonight's conversation. After Dr. Kirshner has delivered his opening remarks, all panelists will answer the questions that you've submitted over the last few days. But you will also have the opportunity to submit questions during the program tonight. For those of you who have joined us before, you know the drill. For those of you who are new to our program, here's what it takes. On the bottom of your screen, you'll see the Q&A feature. All you have to do is submit your questions. Every single question will be anonymous and we will get to as many of them as we possibly can. So without further wasting any time, because it's important to get all these doctors talking about this really important, important subject, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Robert Kirshner. And Dr. Kirshner, we are so honored that you could take the time and be with us tonight. And we are excited that you and your colleagues will be joining us. Thank you, Tony, and uh, good evening. Really, uh, I'm excited also about being here. I want to uh, to talk about our favorite subject, skin and skin diseases and skin treatment. And I'm thrilled to be uh, amongst the audience to, uh, tonight and also my great colleagues at the uh, Department of uh, the Dr. Philip Freud Department of Dermatology and Cutaneous Surgery. I want to start by telling you a little bit about the department, giving a little history uh, about uh, our great department. Uh, founded 65 years ago, uh, our department has become one of the top dermatology departments, not only in the United States, but in the entire world. Uh, we're renowned for innovation, discovery, uh, treating patients, scientific advancements, and developing leaders. And, uh, and just uh, two years ago, or actually last year in 2019, we named our department the Dr. Philip Frost Department of Dermatology and Cutaneous Surgery. Uh, this is really special because it honored Dr. Philip Frost, who is a dermatologist, a renowned dermatologist, who not only trained at University of Miami Jackson Memorial Hospital, but was on faculty for six years as a professor. Dr. Frost went on to great uh, business acclaim and tremendous success. And uh, in addition to his uh, renown as a dermatologist and as a businessman, also is one of South Florida's great philanthropists. And his uh, support of our department has really empowered us to, uh, to do things uh, that we're gonna share tonight and things that we'll, we'll, uh, we continue to do to advance uh, care in the coming years. But as ex excited as I am about the legacy of the department, I'm really 
equally even more excited about our department today. Um, we, on a daily basis, take care of patients, advance care, treat the, teach the next generation of uh, leaders in dermatology and advance the science across the spectrum of skin diseases. We have world experts in skin cancer, wound healing, itch, psoriasis, uh, skin rejuvenation, uh, among others. And the people that we've uh, assembled today represent that great leadership and our great experts in our department. So I'm tremendously excited about what, uh, what this evening holds for us. Um, we are, uh, we're blessed to have uh, the opportunity to share our, our knowledge with you today and look forward to the, uh, answering uh, some of the great questions that are coming at us. So Tony, back to you. Dr. Kirster, thank you so much. And that leads us into the Q&A portion of our event tonight. So let's turn to our very first question. And Dr. Kirster, this is for you. So you're going to kick it off. Given the array of things your department sees and treats, what are the most exciting developments happening in dermatology right now? Oh, my. Well, uh, as hopefully you'll, you'll see from all of us, uh, we're quite passionate about, the, uh, about dermatology. But I think that the thing that's most exciting about uh, uh, what's happening in dermatology today is that we're bridging advances in the lab and in research and translating them to patient care. Uh, we're taking uh, novel innovations about personalized medicine, directed therapies, um, specific for patients and their diseases, and now we're able to apply them to the care of their uh, to, uh, care of patients. And, and what's very special about the skin is that it's so accessible. Certainly patients feel very comfortable with their skin. They see it every morning. When they have a problem with their skin, they, uh, uh, it's really important to them. But also we can sample it, we can test it. And advances in stem cells, gene therapy, we'll talk about rejuvenation and aging and senescence, we're able to study the skin and it has impact not only on the skin, but as the body of the whole. And I think those type of opportunities really represent uh, one of the things I'm most excited about in, um, in dermatology today. Thank you, Dr. Kirstner. Dr. Tang, welcome. The question's for you. Why is skin cancer detection important and how can I recognize signs and symptoms? Hi, Tony. Um, so skin cancer um, as a whole is the most common malignancy both in the U.S. and worldwide. Um, the American Cancer Society estimates that there will be over 5 million cases of non-melanoma skin cancer diagnosed in 2020 and upwards of 100,000 cases of melanoma as well. Um, and for that matter, so it's, um, it's a, it has morbidity um, in terms of up to 7,000 people will die of melanoma. Um, of those cases. And it's the fifth most costly cancer to treat uh, overall. Um, and the incidence is rising probably due to aging, um, you know, uh, prep, um, trends in the population, um, overall um, cumulative uh, sun exposure through uh, the years, and also the concept of immunosenescence, meaning as we age, our immune system uh, wanes in protecting against uh, UV induced damage. And for the most part, I'd recommend um, you know, um, looking out for anything new, changing, or unusual on the skin. Um, the most um, easy anecdote to, um, to recall is the ugly duckling sign, meaning to look for the outlier lesion that doesn't belong in the skin and um, either seeing, um, you know, if, uh, any member of your department or, you know, or primary care physician um, and when that's detected. Dr. Tang, thank you. Dr. Jaimez, welcome. I already had a skin cancer. Is there anything I should do to prevent or detect new skin cancers early on? Hi, good evening, Tony. Uh, very happy to be here tonight. It's really an honor and a great pleasure to share uh, with all of you our um, what we do and what uh, Dr. Kirchner said we are passionate about and very nice uh, to really share with everyone. So basically after uh, anyone has a first uh, skin cancer, uh, there is the risk of having a second one. 
Um, so important, very important to self skin exam. So what Dr. Tang already mentioned, so check your skin at home once a month, anything new or changing, that's what we wanna see. And new is anything that comes was not there and stays for more than three or four weeks, then you should call that to the attention to your uh, physician, your dermatologist, and or anything new or anything changing and changes anything. I mean, it was flat, it's getting raised, uh, changing change shape, color, form. And as you see, I didn't really mention color. So it could be pink, brown, or black. So that's important from the patient's end, some protection, and obviously uh, being surveillance with your dermatologist. Uh, and the frequency will change. It could be every three months, six months, or at least once a year. So basically it's being on top and if anything is going to come again, then we want to really detect it early, where the scars are going to be minimal and there is a lot of things to do. Dr. Jimenez, we're going to stay with you because we just had this question submitted and it kind of goes with what you were just talking about. And the question goes like this. I've had a routine checkup for skin cancer where the physician does it in person. Are there alternatives to this checkup that involve technology? For example, a scan of the skin that would detect possible skin cancer, whether basal cell or a melanoma? Um, that's a great question and very pertinent for our uh, reality. Uh, a lot of uh, imaging techniques now that we have. And um, so there are many things that we can do. I don't know if exactly the question was geared toward telehealth. Um, so, uh, but I guess, probably I'm gonna just talk about what we do. So when the patient goes in person and is under surveillance, we have different imaging techniques, including uh, what we call total body photos or photography, mold mapping, same name, where we just uh, make baseline images of the patient, clinical and with um, technique that is called dermoscopy. So we are able to track the patient in time and really detect things that are very early that you can see them before your naked eye can see it. So that's how we take advantage of the technology. There are systems that are uh, have also the aid of artificial intelligence and help us detect new things. Um, so yes, this, there is a lot of uh, ongoing on, on that. That was a great question. Dr. Hu, welcome. We look forward to hearing you tonight. I already had a skin cancer, excuse me, I am interested in getting cosmetic injections. Which procedure should I start with, Dr. Hu? Hi, Tony, thanks for moderating for us. That's a great question, but I do want to preface by saying skin rejuvenation should really come after skin health. So as my colleagues, Dr. Jaime and Dr. Tain, Dr. Kirsten were talking about a little bit earlier, Skin health is really the most important part of uh, dermatology. We want to really encourage everyone to get a full body skin check by a board certified dermatologist. More frequently, if you have had a history of skin cancer or other risk factors. So after you have taken care of your skin health, a lot of times people now start thinking about skin rejuvenation, looking younger, feeling uh, the same as how they want to also look uh, externally. So in terms of procedures, we often start with very easy procedures such as Botox or Dysport or other muscle relaxers. Uh, we uh, can also talk about um, volumizers to correct deeper lines and shadows. There are laser treatments, chemical peels, the list goes on and on. So ideally, we should really do a face-to-face -face, uh, consultation uh, where I or my colleagues will evaluate your needs, evaluate your uh, health, evaluate uh, what really bothers you. And then we can make a plan. So truthfully, the best treatment is part of a maintenance, at least a two-year or three-year plan, not just like a one-time deal because honestly, the best results are achieved when we have a roadmap. Dr. Hu, thank you so much. That, that, was, that was a great answer. Dr. Mandy, welcome. It's nice to see you, sir. What are realistic expectations for cosmetic dermatologic procedures? Of course, we're, we're hoping to stretch those out, but the realistic expectation, and there's been a great deal of science involved in this, is approximately expecting if you do 
all of the things or some of the things that Dr. Who spoke about, perhaps a five to seven year improvement in your in your normal stated age. So if someone comes in at 50, it's very likely if they do say Botox and a filler and maybe a, a laser treatment, they'll look five years younger than their apparent peer group. Uh, you know, we'd all like to look 15 years younger than our peer group, but that doesn't happen. And I, it's always funny, I'm sure Sasha uh, experiences the same thing. People come in with a picture of themselves as a 25 year old. They say, I wanna look like this. Well, that's a little less than realistic, but um, I think aging faces is, uh, it's our brand. That's what we are. And people see it every morning when they get up and it becomes, you know, it's who we are. So if we can make it look five years younger and healthier and more vibrant and more vital, then we've accomplished a lot. And that's the realistic expectation. Well, so much from my 25-year-old picture, I guess I better put it away, Dr. Mandy. <laughs> but that, that's great advice. And the, the realistic part of it is really important here. Dr. Kirshner, is there anything new to help heal or remove a scar? Yeah, Tony. So it turns out that in theory, we don't have to scar. In utero, if you wound a fetus in utero with a, a, a surgery, they don't scar. So our, we have the knowledge in our bodies to prevent scarring. But then when we're born, we start to scar. So the long-term goal is to try to replicate what happens in utero and have scarless healing. But we're not there yet. Hopefully with scientific advances and our department and other places, we'll get there. But, uh, but when you have a scar, we have many technologies to try to prevent and then reduce it. There are physical devices to release the mechanical tension. And even things like uh, Botox releases the tension and prevents spreading of scars. There are dressings that have been developed to prevent the spreading of the scars. Uh, there are lasers, uh, and I'll, I, I'll ask Dr. Who or Dr. Mandy to mention some of these lasers that can be used on a scar uh, to improve the appearance of the scar once it's there. And then that we can inject certain medications anti-inflammatory and anti-fibrotic medications such as steroids and uh, uh, chemotherapeutic agents to, to lessen the scar. So we have at our disposal now an armamentarium of things, but the hope is that someday we'll have even better tools to prevent scarring. Dr. Kirshner, thank you so much. Dr. Tang, what are novel treatments for advanced skin cancers now? It's a great question, Tony. So, um, and there's been, there've been a lot of strides in the advancement of uh, the treatment of advanced and unresectable skin cancers. Um, for basal cell carcinoma, which is the most common malignancy of them all, um, about uh, almost 10 years ago, there is a the development of a, um, a specific targeted therapy um, blocking a pathway that's very commonly mutated in basal cell skin cancers. But again, this is typically reserved for ones that are unresectable or have metastasized, meaning have spread elsewhere to the body. Um, and then in the realm of melanoma, um, there have been also additional targeted therapies and also the concept of immunotherapy, which is utilizing the immune system to, um, to fight the, the cancer cells. Um, and then on that same, um, in that same lane, We've been using immunotherapy, um, you know, going backwards to treat non-melanoma skin cancers as well. About two years ago, uh, there was the first um, immunotherapy agent that was uh, FDA approved for the treatment of advanced and unresectable squamous cell carcinoma, uh, with a great response rate, and um, it, you know, it's been um, an increasing trend and you know, great um, area of research. Um, for us at Sylvester, and it's a very exciting time where, um, you know, hopefully we can decrease the mortality of this small subset of patients that uh, don't, um, that are not treated with our local therapies in the office. Dr. Tang, stay there because we just had this question submitted. So let's expand what you were just talking about. And the question goes, are there alternatives to surgical removal of basal cell and can lasers be used? 
That's a great question. Um, this is, um, I'm speaking off label, um, but there are, um, there are studies and uh, publications out there. Um, it's in the very, very early stages. Um, there've been, the, um, lasers have been utilized um, to treat very thin um, basal cells, uh, skin cancers off the head and neck, meaning in areas that are up lower stakes. Um, and it's a a laser that targets uh, blood vessels specifically, uh, because the rationale is that in basal cell skin cancer, you have a dilated uh, blood vessel that's feeding the tumor, and um, the the mechanism of action is, you know, presumably that we're um, we're ablating and getting rid of that uh, that large feeder vessel. But again, this is very off label, and um, a lot of um, speaking on on, on the um, regarding scars. Um, because it's such a, you know, skin cancer is such a prevalent uh, disease, uh, we are um, hopefully, you know, moving in the right direction and looking towards, um, you know, more cosmetically um, acceptable alternatives aside from surgery. I just want to echo Dr. Tang's comment. We do have the laser at our university. Uh, we have used on a few patients with very uh, good success rate. However, it's really for patients who uh, cannot be or uh, cannot tolerate or not really good surgical candidates or for other proven more effective treatment. So laser therapy is possible. Um, for further questions, feel free to reach our department. We can definitely uh, give you more feedback in person. Thank you both Dr. Tang and Dr. Hu. And Dr. Hu, while I have you here, this one was submitted a couple of days ago and I'll add on to it. But the question is what type of sunscreen is best? And, and quite frankly, we are inundated with all these different sunscreens. When you walk into a drugstore, even a supermarket uh, from levels of different protection, please tell us what's the best for everyone. That's a great question. I get asked that almost every single day. You know, the truthful answer is that the best sunscreen is the one that you're most likely to use every single day. Um, so uh, sunscreen, cosmetic uh, um, appearance, and also how it feels on the skin is very important. But honestly, as long as your sunscreen is SPF 30 or higher, has a broad coverage of UVA and UVB, and you are not only using the adequate amount, but also reapplying often, ideally every couple hours if you're gonna be outdoors or at least twice a day, you, if you're uh, driving a lot, uh, if you are getting a lot of indirect exposure. So sunscreen matters, reapplication matters, uh, the number matters, but honestly, at the end of the day is whether you put it on or not. <laughs> <laughs> well put, but we're going to keep you here, Dr. Hu, because we just had this uh, question submitted here. And it goes like this, Korean sunblocks have more PA while the USA hasn't approved a new sunscreen since 1999. So we are really behind. Additionally, USA sunscreens are not cosmetically elegant, thus discouraging daily use. I want to know your thoughts. Um, so whoever asked the question is very knowledgeable. So it is true that um, FDA always is a little bit more conservative compared to other regulatory agencies in Europe, Australia, and also Asia, uh, Asia countries. Um, so that being said, um, it's not that difficult to find a sunscreen that's suitable for your skin. Most problem when people experience in terms of sunscreens, actually the preservatives, other additives in addition to the active ingredients. So we do have a list of uh, as sunscreens that we as dermatologists prefer have found good tolerability in our patients. Um, but in terms of active ingredients, I know that there are a few such as Mexero, Tenosorb, are ingredients that are, are very effective against UVA and UVB that are proven, they're like approved and available in Europe, but not so much in the US. But I would say, don't let that be a factor of not using sunscreen. Um, there will be a sunscreen that's good for your skin type. Uh, just be patient. Typically, uh, I highly recommend looking for sunscreen that's just sunscreen. Don't forget about sunscreen with moisturizer. Sun, forget about tender sunscreen for anti-aging. Focus on sunscreen meant for sunscreen and some for protecting your skin. And then secondly, look for fragrance-free. And then thirdly, 
look at the ingredient list make sure it doesn't have a lot of uh, filler ingredients, preservatives. Great, Dr. Hu, thank you so much for that. Dr. Mandy, how much weight will I lose with liposuction or cool sculpting? I think the most important thing is to recognize that liposculpture, whether it's with uh, cool sculpting or with liposuction, is not really a weight loss procedure, it's a contouring procedure. And what we're trying to do is to remove fat from areas that interfere with the total body appearance. So areas like the waist, the side of the thighs, um, the knees, areas that look out of proportion, we try to put back in proportion. Uh, by law, we are limited to the amount of fat we can remove in a single procedure. So generally speaking, the most one could expect to remove, say in the state of Florida, uh, would be somewhere around four to six pounds. And that would be probably not making a lot of in impression on a scale, but it makes a dramatic impression in clothing. Dr. Mandy, thank you. We're gonna keep you here because this was just submitted. Are there any topical creams that really work for diminishing dark spots? Uh, and which active ingredient should I look for? Um, you know, the dark spots is a very broad word. I mean, a, a, a mole, for instance, is a dark spot and it won't go away with a, a cream. Uh, but the spots that occur with aging, many of them will respond to either retinoids, which would, you know, you know, as a vitamin A derivative or to a, a medication like hydroquinone. Hydroquinone is available over the counter in a 2% concentration and by prescription in a four or greater percent concentration. And it works very well in many patients who have dark spots or who have what we call melasma, pigmentation associated with hormones in pregnancy. Um, we also use, uh, you know, Dr. Hugh was just talking about, we also use lasers a great deal to uh, diminish or remove brown spots that are age related and uh, or sun related. I want to just expand on uh, Dr. Mandy's answer. Um, there are a few ingredients I like to talk about uh, to my patients in addition to topical retinoids, SPF. Uh, so kojic acid, lactic acid, niacinamide, acetic acid, uh, lady arbutin, as well as topical transamic acid are all very uh, encouraging and uh, safe, effective ingredients or, or alternative to hydroquinone. Because we all know as dermatologists that even with over-the-counter hydroquinone long-term usage, you may get what we call ochronosis, which is a paradoxical hyperpigmentation that you definitely don't want to get into. And then lastly, if a dark spot, if a brown spot does not get better, please see one of us because we definitely don't want to miss a skin cancer. The other thing I think it's important, Sasha, to add what you just said, nothing that we have will make dark spots go away if you don't use sunscreen. Well put, both Dr. Mandy and Dr. Hu, thank you. Dr. Jaimes, what is the best way to protect ourselves from sunlight? So I think I'm going just to summarize what has been done uh, and has been said. Uh, basically, um, sunscreens, when you say sun protection, probably many of your first thought is sunscreen, the creams. And that's, uh, I think it has already been talked about, uh, use broad spectrum, at least 30 for the daily activities. But if you're gonna be outside, probably you wanna hire SPF, um, water resist and reapply every two hours. But we need to remember that it's not only the sunscreen, that we only need to seek, also need to seek the shade, um, to wear the hats with white brim, the sunglasses that are good sunglasses that really protects us from the sun to, for the eye and all around the skin, around the eyes and, um, and the, sun the sun protected clothing. So there are very nice styles and colors and um, that really uh, help us with that. So don't only use the sunscreen, but also the other things, the physical protection is also very important. Dr. Jaimes, does it 
matter the time amount amount of time you spend outside if you're only going to be outside for 20 minutes do you still need to put sunscreen on obviously if it's for longer you should right so in theory uh you hear from uh, i would say most of the dermatologists that uh use your use it as a routine so it will be your the thing that you will put on your morning and obviously it depends also in the time that you're going to be outside. So if you're going to be at noon, you do want to use uh, the sun protection. Great. Dr. Hamish, thank you so much. Dr. Kirshner, what are the latest developments in wound healing? Thank you, Tony. So, uh, so we have, are very lucky in our department because we have probably the, the top uh, department in, in wound healing, regardless of specialty in the U.S. And and if you go to a pharmacy and look at wound healing products or go to clinics in, uh, throughout the United States, many of the products, if not uh, most of the products, have been studied in our department. Um, but one of the things that's very exciting is the development of what we call skin substitutes or artificial skin. Uh, these are products that are grown in the lab and then can be applied to patients' wounds to stimulate healing. The benefit of those is that... Um, you don't have to take the patient's own skin like it, like a skin graft. You don't have to harvest their own skin um, and, uh, and saves a, 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 the wound of a donor site. The problem is, is that they don't necessarily take because they're not the patient's own skin. They're, they're cells from a different donor. So in our department, we're currently uh, in our labs trying to investigate ways to take the cells that are abnormal around the wound because the cells, a wound is a consequence of disease in that area. And we could take those cells and genetically modify them and create healthy cells and a healthy piece of skin from those abnormal cells around the wound. So that's a very exciting uh, advance to, to alter the cells that are abnormal and make them normal. We're also studying stem cells and not just uh, pure stem cells, but what we've learned and scientists in our department have learned is that stem cells produce a protein and it's that protein, which is called an exosome that does the business of stem cells for healing and rejuvenation. So you don't even need the cells anymore. You have those products that the cells produce and they can be applied to wounds to help them heal faster and help them heal better. So there's tremendous amount of excitement uh, about this in the wound healing world. And Dr. Kirstner, we're gonna keep you here because this uh, question was just submitted. It goes like this. My dermatologist has removed my basal cell carcinoma using Mohs surgery procedures. What method does the University of Miami use for skin surgery? Is the Mohs method still considered a preferred approach to remove cancer cells from the skin or are there other surgical protocols that are preferred? Well, thank you very, thanks again for that question. And I think that the most important thing is we tailor the treatment to the patient and to the patient's um, uh, skin cancer and their, co and their other medical problems. So while Mohs is a great treatment to remove certain cancers in certain locations, locations in sensitive areas, locations that are uh, the cancers that have uh, recurred, um, we have an armamentarium of things we can uh, use and I'd like to hand this to Dr. Uh, uh, Tang because she's really uh, one of the people that does a lot of the skin cancer work. And, and I'd like her to comment on the idea of Mohs and other uh, techniques to get rid of skin cancer. And thank you, Dr. Kersner. So absolutely. So uh, Mohs, uh, a micrographic surgery is named after um, a surgeon from the University of Wisconsin, uh, Madison named Frederick Mohs. Uh, who developed this technique of using cryosurgery, um, essentially, where we're able to, um, in office, remove skin cancer and do 100% um, margin control, meaning we can look at all the, the side margins and the deep margins, um, and it's all mapped out and color-coded so that we are very precise in removing um, additional tumor without removing um, unnecessary normal tissue. Um, so that we can give the patient the smallest wound and therefore the, um, the best scar we can offer. 
That being said, it's not it there. Um, it's not a technique that's used on every skin cancer nor on every patient. Um, there are criteria that we um, that we utilize to uh, where it's deemed appropriate or not, um, and it's typically for areas that are higher risk, um, mostly on the head and neck. And then, depending on the tumor, whether it's uh, large or recurrent, uh, we do utilize most surgery off the head and neck as well. Um, and for the most part, it's. I mean, I think the argument of um, you know, where to draw surgery, you know, the line to draw surgery, that's definitely, it's a very, um, you know, it's a tough question to answer because there we'd have, you know, 90 year olds these days that are, that have great, um, you know, light um, survival and it's hard to estimate um, kind of where to draw the line of um, when to treat surgically. Um, that being said, it is, um, you know, the most cost-effective uh, way uh, if it is surgically amenable. Um, but we definitely uh, take it on a case by a case basis, um, and we, uh, you know, we we do uh, incorporate, you know, what patients' uh, preferences when uh, moving uh, forward with most surgery or not. Tony, if I could, I just want to add uh, one thing um, because there, we've had some advances in our department. Uh, many people get multiple skin cancers, and um, and uh, uh, our our uh, clinicians have been looking at the use of a, a vaccine. We hear a lot about vaccines for, uh, for uh, COVID and such, but this is a vaccine that's already available. It's the, va the wart vaccine against human papillomavirus that prevents genital warts and cervical cancer. But we, ha we have some experience using it as a prevention for people who get multiple skin cancers to reduce the occurrence of more skin cancers. And so far, the data is very, uh, very positive. Uh, it looks like there, there's something there. And there's a fair bit of science behind the idea of uh, vaccination for against human papillomavirus as a technique to reduce uh, the burden of skin cancer uh, in patients. Thank you both. Fascinating. Dr. Tang, uh, can viruses lead to skin cancer? It's a great question, Tony, especially in the climate of uh, coronavirus these days. Um, but there are other viruses that are um, that um, affect uh, us. Um, so that absolutely. So uh, there are certain lymphomas that are caused by viruses. Um, there's another tumor called Merkel cell carcinoma um, that has a specific um, virus called the polyoma uh, virus that um, can be seen in up to 80% of all the, of those tumors. And then as Dr. Kirshner was mentioning, um, the human papilloma virus um, has also been um, implicated in uh, squamous cell carcinoma. Um, the, prep, the incidence of that ranges uh, depending on whether an individual is immunocompetent, meaning having a normal immune system versus having amino, uh, having a suppressed immune system. Um, so in the immunocompetent um, patients, it's been seen in about 50% of all squamous cell carcinomas, and then the immunosuppressed um, upwards to 90%. And it's not all war, uh, ward viruses. There are you know, hundreds of serotypes um, that um, can affect humans. Um, there are benign types, which is cause, which is cause warts. Um, and then there are malignant ones that can undergo uh, transformation and, and lead to skin cancer. Um, we still don't know um, enough about it. We, we know that it exists um, in, the, in the tumor, but we don't know the, the, the relationship, whether, is it, whether it's causative, um, meaning there's a direct um, you know, causation, or whether it's commensal, merely it's just living being there um, and not truly, um, you know, causing um, carcinogenesis. Um, and Dr. Kersner and one of our um, brilliant colleagues, um, Dr. Nichols, has done a lot of work in this um, area, um, the HPV vaccine, uh, which can, has historically been known to help prevent um, awards and, and cancer, um, have been utilized to treat um, skin cancer as well. And it's a very novel technique um, to, um, to treat skin cancers that perhaps may um, not be resectable or someone that's not able to tolerate surgery. Um, and it's, all, it's a form of immunotherapy per se. Um, and Dr. Nichols and I are interested in pursuing other um, avenues of how to use uh, the war vaccine, whether alone or in conjunction with immunotherapy to augment the response of, of our innate, uh, you know, of our own immune system to fight off skin cancer. Dr. Tang, thank you so much.
Dr. Jaimez, my mother had melanoma. Any recommendation for me and my children to protect ourselves? Um, well, again, um, important that uh, some protection and family members, especially first degree members, should also be seen by dermatologists, especially if they have a lot of moles. And as we already said, um, check their skin once a month and be enrolled with the dermatology so that uh, we can do full body skin checks to family members of melanoma since we know that family history, especially of melanoma, is also a risk factor. So basically very easy to remember. Check your skin and both with the dermatologist and at home. Dr. Hamas, thank you so much. Dr. Hu, when should a person start using retinol for anti-aging? Okay, great question. So retinol, just for people who don't know a lot about retinol, it's a topical ingredient similar to vitamin A. It's considered almost like a gold standard in topical anti-aging in the sense that it helps our cells to differentiate and uh, to, to have a better turnover. It stimulates collagen. It helps us to reverse and repair some external environmental sun damage, or also known as oxidative stress. So ideally, we should start using a topical retinol in our 20s because studies have shown that we start experiencing intrinsic and extrinsic, so internal and external aging starting in our 20s. But then that being said, if you don't do sun, if you don't use sunscreen, if you're gonna go use tanning bed, it doesn't matter when you start retinol. So really the basics is sunscreen, have a good, uh, healthy, some protective behavior, and then we can talk about aging. All right, Dr. Hu, thank you. But we're going to keep you here because we just had this question sent to us. For physical sunscreen, it starts like clothing and hats and sunglasses. Will any clothing work or do you have to use clothing that has the UPF ratings? Okay, so ideally, if you are looking for true sun protective clothing, you should look for label says UPF, that stands for UV protective factor. Typically there are 50 plus. So there are a few really good brands out there, Cooley Bar, Columbia. There are reputable brands that actually make uh, sun protective clothing. Um, I love sun hats, uh, sun hats with uh, either impregnant material that helps to block uh, SP, uh, block UV, or sometimes the fabric is special weave that gives you additional protection. So sunscreen is good, but it's not 100%. If you're gonna be out on the water, sailing or boating, wear long sleeve UPF clothing will give you that extra peace of mind. Great, Dr. Hu, thank you. Dr. Mandy, do I need fillers or Botox? There we go. Um, that's the most common question we get in cosmetic work. And the answer is you may need one or the other because they, differ, they work differently. Botox works on what we call dynamic wrinkles. That means the wrinkles that occur when you make a facial expression. But Botox can't be used very readily in certain dynamic wrinkles. For instance, you're making a little bit of a lower face expression, which if we use Botox might cause you to drool or do things that wouldn't be pleasant. But we use fillers to replace volume or to fill areas where you have wrinkles that are um, made either dynamically or by static wrinkles, which are due to basically skeletal loss. And as we age, we lose our skeleton and that causes skin to fold on itself. So we can replace the volume, we can't replace the bone but we can replace the volume that's lost by using a filler. Most patients who come in for cosmetic work, especially people over say 35 or 40, wind up using both products. They use a, a neurotoxin like Botox to relax the muscles, and then they use filler to fill the volume loss. Thank you, Dr. Manning. We're gonna keep you here because we just had this one sent in. Does collagen help to rejuvenate the skin? And if so, what's the best form? Is it pill or cream? 
Well, actually, collagen, if you took it by pill, would be digested and wouldn't be collagen anymore because collagen is made up of a series of amino acids that your stomach and enzymes would digest. Uh, collagen does not penetrate the skin when applied to the surface of the skin. So truthfully, the only way to have collagen is either to use a medication such as a retinoid, which uh, Dr. Hu was talking about, which helps you make collagen, or to inject things which make you make collagen. And there are certain fillers such as polyolactic acid and calcium hydroxy uh, uh, appetite, which if you inject, will cause your body to make new collagen. But you can't just rub collagen on and get it through the skin. And Dr. Mandy, thank you. Dr. Jaime, this one just sent in. Perceptin, progetta, and radiation cause unbearable itching affecting quality of life. Prescription and non-prescription uh, ointments or antihistamines just don't seem to work. I believe it is a problem related to inflammation. Is anyone doing any research or does anyone have any answers other than telling patients not much can be done until chemo is completed? Patients suffer tremendously with constant itching not solved by medication during chemo. Is anyone looking for answers and the relief for us? So I think uh, it's uh, patient asked to the exact place where uh, a lot of itch research is going on and we have our um, colleague, Dr. Josipovic, uh, which focuses uh, clinical and his research interest is each basically and is world renowned. So there are more things that just saying nothing works. And for sure also if radiation, there are many things that we can do before starting radiation or even the, sign, the treatments, uh, there are things that we can do before the patient gets in the treatment during and after. Uh, but yes, there are many things that can be done, moisturizing the skin and obviously medications that can be taken uh, uh, orally by mouth. Uh, but yes, there are things and uh, more than just saying that nothing can be done. Uh, for sure, this is the great place to be. Thank you, Dr. Hamas. Dr. Kirshner, does every patient with allergic contact dermatitis need a patch test? Uh well, that, thank you for the question. It's a, it's a good question. And the simple answer is not, uh, the simple answer is no, not everybody needs a, a patch test. Typically, we patch test people who's unresponsive to simple therapies like topical treatments, if they don't get better, or if their uh, allergic contact dermatitis returns. So if they have recurrent or refractory allergic contact dermatitis, then it's worthwhile going through the efforts of finding out what they're allergic to so, they, so that they can avoid it. Um, and patch testing is a great technology, but it doesn't always give the answer that you're hoping for. You're hoping to find an, an allergy, an allergen that you're allergic to, and you can avoid it. But while we test to tens or even hundreds of allergens, there are thousands of allergens out there. And sometimes we don't test to every single allergen and we may miss it. Or you may be allergic to something and that's not the culprit. You're allergic to cement, but you're not coming in contact with cement. It's not causing your problems. So while patch testing is one of our tools, interpreting the results are really uh, very important as you manage a patient with a difficult contact dermatitis. Thank you, Dr. Kirshner. Dr. Hu, this one just sent in as well. What are your best dietary recommendations for healthy, youthful skin? Oh, I love that <laughs> because nutraceutical is definitely something that we're interested in. We're looking beyond uh, treatment. We're looking at prevention. So even though the data is, it's very hard to find evidence-based studies supporting nutraceuticals, just because it's very difficult to have a uh, double blind randomized trial, especially on nutraceuticals. So that being said, based on what we know in the current literature, um, based on also safety and efficacy, what I like to recommend to my patients are typically vitamin C because the vitamin C is a cofactor for collagen production. CoQ10, another cofactor necessary for collagen production is also a very good antioxidant for heart health. 
I also like to recommend something called Helio Care, which is actually derived from a Brazilian firm um, plant, has really good data, um, medical data in helping people to add a little bit extra SPF against sun damage. And then lastly, instead of focusing on supplements, try to focusing on other um, aspects of your life. A healthy diet that has a lot of greens, plant-based diet, ideally exercise because we know that exercise actually helps to slow down aging by reducing what we call glycation products and advanced glycation products, which means sugar added to our protein that uh, makes our body more inflammatory, that breaks down our collagen faster. So exercise, healthy diet, supplements like vitamin C, CoQ10, and SPF uh, protective factor from HeloCare. Dr. Can I add one quick uh, addition to that? I think niacinamide, vitamin B3, has been shown to be not only cancer preventive uh, with skin cancer, but also is very important in glycolation and uh, in, general, in general health. And it's a very good supplement that you can take in the form of either niacinamide or nicotinamide. They're all derivatives of vitamin B3. Doctors, thank you. In fact, we're going we're gonna to throw this one out to the team because it just came in to us. Uh, are there any advances to getting rid of cellulite? And please, all of you can weigh in if you'd like. Well, there are a lot of options, a lot of gimmicks out there. First of all, topical medication or treatments do not work for cellulite. <laughs> I just want to put it out there. So uh, in our clinics, what I like to do is a combination of microneedling and injecting the biostimulator Dr. Mandy mentioned before, the poly -L lactic acid. We have had really good results. Um, so that's really uh, a good combination. Microneedling to resurface the top layer and then uh, injecting stim biostimulator to help uh, not only breaking up the bands to hold the skin down, but also stimulate collagen to fill in the dimples. Um, and one more thing also, so it's not in the market yet, but there's a product called collagenase, meaning it's an enzyme that breaks down collagen, which are uh, the bands that tether the fat, which cause dimpling in cellulite. Um, and it's a treatment that's been used um, in the Putrin's contracture, which is like the tightening band on, on the hands, which is very common. Um, but that's, um, you know, on, uh, hopefully soon to be on the market. Dr. Mandy or Dr. Kirshner, would you like to weigh in on this? I was just going to mention what was just mentioned about the collagenase. Uh, the, the data is good, but not fabulous. Um, I don't know that the, uh, that the uh, cure for cellulite is out there yet, but I agree with Dr. Hu that, that uh, the use of sculpture on the right patient works very well. Dr. Kirshner? No, but I would mention uh, that uh, I think uh, Dr. Mandy mentioned the idea that the treatment's not there yet. And I think that's one of the things that is special about um, an academic uh, dermatology department is that while many people will look at a problem and say there's not an answer, we look at a problem and we look for a solution to that problem. So um, each, each challenge represents an opportunity uh, to, uh, to not only help the patients that we see on a daily basis, but help patients throughout the, the country and the world with our discoveries and innovation. And Dr. Jaimez. Well, I just will add up, um, besides the healthy diet, uh, exercise. <laughs> so that's also not only, we need to keep it up. So with the exercise. <laughs> Thank you, doctor. It always comes back to exercise, doesn't it? It really does. Uh, Dr. Kirshner, is eczema a permanent skin condition or can it go away and can it come on with stress? Right, so eczema is a, is a kind of a wastebasket term for a lot of inflammation of the skin. But at the same time, it's been used as a synonym for something called atopic dermatitis which is a, a condition that generally starts in, in childhood. And the large percentage of those people with atopic dermatitis, also 
referred to as eczema, get better with time. Some of them continue on in their lifetime, but uh, throughout their life, but, uh, but many of them get better. So, so you, you, you don't have to have eczema your whole life, even if you have it for the first 10 or 20 or 30 years of your life, it could get better and go away. Uh, or you could develop it later and it continue on. The good news is that there are new treatments being developed specifically for that disease that have really transformed people's lives. Uh, because as we learn more about why eczema occurs, the mechanisms of actions, the molecular and genetic patterns, we can target therapies uh, uh, for that. And yes, stress is has physiologic effects and stress can make um, uh, eczema worse. And, and I think people during this time, this pandemic and, and all, the thing, all the challenges we're all experiencing we're seeing a, a, a flurry of people who have a present with eczema or are having uh, flares of their eczema that they didn't have before. So it, it is a challenging time, but thankfully we have some treatment options that can make their lives better as perhaps as, as they wait, we wait for them to outgrow it, hopefully. I don't know how this hour's flown by. It's been absolutely amazing. We wanna thank all of our panelists who have helped us explore this groundbreaking research and all these efforts in skin health and skin cures. And that was our last question of the evening. But before we close this town hall tonight, I really would like to ask Dr. Kirshner, uh, Dr., your final thoughts on all of this and your colleagues that were with us tonight and, and all of the questions that were submitted and all of the great work that you're doing um, at the University of Miami. Well, well th thank you, Tony. And, and I wanna thank uh, the people that are listening uh, because they really inspire um, us to do what we do. I wanna thank you for moderating this uh, session. And I wanna thank, uh, all, thank all my colleagues uh, on the panel tonight. Um, they represent the best that dermatology has to offer in the United States and worldwide. And it's not th just the people here, but everyone in our department. And I think what, really distinguishes our group of physicians is that while we care exquisitely about the individual patient in front of us, we also want to make an impact beyond the walls of our own clinics through teaching, through education like we're doing uh, now, through uh, contributing to the scientific literature and making discoveries together as a team with other, our other uh, uh, clinicians and with our physician scientists. We really want to change people's lives. And, um, and we have a partnership with the community. We have a, and part of that partnership is uh, uh, we try to develop uh, innovation and discoveries to make people's lives better. And sometimes people in the community are able to support our work with philanthropy and the, and the work and, and the support that we get from our donors uh, really enables us to do the things we wanna do and to help and advance the care of skin disease that you can see that we're so passionate about. Uh, I think it was evident on the, on the panel tonight, each of our own expertise and uh, coming together as a team. So I wanna thank you once again. I wanna thank the board of trustees uh, for supporting us. I wanna thank the, the school administration and the university for supporting us. I wanna thank all my colleagues. I wanna thank all the uh, donors and the people that have supported us in the past for what they've done for us. And, uh, and just know that uh, every day we go out to do our best for each of them and for the community at large. So, so thank you very much, Tony. Really great to be here and really had a fun time tonight. It's great to talk about our favorite subject, the skin. It, you could tell, doctor, and you know we were sort of saying in jest, but it's the truth because tonight basically was the Mount Rushmore of dermatology, listening to all of these doctors. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kirshner, and thank all of you for participating in tonight's In the Know Town Hall. Again, uh, kind of echoing Dr. Kirshner's words, I think we learned valuable and insightful information tonight, especially in light of where we live, work, and raise our family in South Florida. What did we learn? How important all of these things are to we, that we need to do to take care of our skin, whether it's you know sunscreen, exercise, diet, all of these issues. You know, as alums and supporters of the University of Miami, we should all be so proud of this group of dedicated and skilled doctors who quite frankly are here to serve and to educate.
Please remember that a full recording of this program will be posted online. Look for the link in the coming days. And if you would like to give to the Dr. Philip Frost Department of Dermatology and Cutaneous Surgery or the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center, we will have those details for you in an email tomorrow. Now, in a moment, you will see a survey about tonight's town hall on your screen. Please take a minute to submit your feedback. And quite frankly, I've taken the survey. It doesn't take a minute. It takes about 30 seconds. It's important to us because what it will do is help us understand your interest and improve our program. And as always, we wish you and your family good health. Stay safe. Have a very safe and a very happy Thanksgiving. And remember, from all of us to all of you, it's always about the you. Good night.